Um, yeah, I missed I missed everything as people said was said earlier, but I guess you were waiting to to get started on the OCIP two stuff, right? Yeah, you can you can basically take it from here. Just announce that you're the only uh, agenda item, and so the floor is yours. Okay, cool. Um, so there are a couple of ways we can do this. Um, one way is we can just go through all of the different requirements and discuss them. Um, the other way is we can we can just I mean, I guess it depends on how much time we have and how long we spend discussing them. Um, but we can also start just having discussions about um, paring down the requirements. So there are some of the of the points that arguably should be merged um, that are off the top of my head are sort of obvious. Um, but yeah, I think probably it's a good idea to just sort of go through um, the list of them first. Uh, all right, so let me just open up the D. So, yeah, um, maybe I should share my screen, maybe that would be better. Uh, share screen. Oh, cool. Uh, okay, right, so, um, yes, yeah, so we can just sort of work down the list. So, um, first of all, the plan would be that we would have a uh, hope big enough for everyone. Um, yeah, so, the, so right now, at least in theory, we've all sort of agreed upon what the base requirements are, or at least people have sort of proposed what they would like to be included um, in the list. So we can just sort of go down the list to just quickly have a recap of all of them. Um, so I'll go through the ones that uh, people can chime in if they would like to comment on individual ones, but yeah, so the first one is obviously reduced duplication. Um, so this is effectively the idea would be that you would, um, you want to avoid having duplication in several respects. Um, this is sort of like a more general theme rather than, than an individual requirement, which is that you want to avoid having not just uh, duplication both in the storage side of things, so in when you're actually running the containers, you want to avoid duplication on disk, as well as duplication of transfers, um, as well as, uh, yeah, other types of duplication. So effectively, there, there, there is at least two different types of duplication that we're discussing here. Um, and so this is something which was addressed by my original propo proposal. Um, which was solved by using ref links on the storage side and then um, constant mind chunking and an open, uh, an open um, like per, per file blobs or per chunk blobs um, on the transfer side. Um, but obviously the, the actual design will, will probably differ given all the problems we'd have with distribution. Um, but that's like the general overlying theme of the duplication stuff. Um, and obviously the existing spec limitation is basically the tar archives give you none of absolutely none of what I just said. Um, yeah. Uh, did anyone else want to give uh, chime in or anything? I, I think it's sort of pretty. Um, just curious, what is the scope of what you're covering in the sense of, um, like we, we see the Docker hub in the Docker registry kind of you know, distribution spec with HTTPS is really uh, internet focused and internet optimized where things are compressed because the internet is slow, where the local machine is kind of fast, where there's another environment where like within a cloud it, with the private registries, your network is fast and you're sharing compute and memory. So it's, you know, there's a different optimization. Is your goal here that this would only work in a high network reliable environment or it works over public internet protocols, slow, unreliable networks as well? The plan would be for it to work over slow and reliable networks, which is why um, it would be important to have a discussion with distribution in terms of how we're going to deal with this, because the proposal that I had originally would require like several orders of magnitude more round trips than you currently have for image pulling, um, which would obviously be prohibitively slow. Um, I mean, obviously, coming from Australia, I can tell you I'm well aware of how slow the internet is. Um, it, yeah, and so there is. The idea would be that we would reduce uh, transfer duplication. So you would reduce over the general internet. Um, and that would basically boil down to, oh, and obviously um, discussions of 
whether or not we want to do uh, yeah, binary deltas and stuff like that is also included in this in this list. Basically, the point is is like how many ways can we reduce duplication both in terms of transfer. So if you're downloading a new version of like an Ubuntu or OpenSUSE or Debian image, um, how do you make it so that you don't when you don't download the same 40 meg blob each time you have to download a new version of the image? Um, because obviously between different you know, distro updates. It's not like they're gonna. It's not like libc is being updated every single time you update the image. Um, usually, it's only a couple of packages that have changed between versions. Um, so to solve that problem, there are a couple of possible solutions. And ideally, they would they would solve both. Uh, they would help with the like slow internet problem. Um, as for local lands, I mean, as you said, they're they're fast enough. Ideally, we would not we would solve the problem there as well. But I imagine that the benefit you'd get is much less because if it's, if it's fast enough, if it's local, I mean, it'd be fast enough to download 40 megs each time. Yeah. I just, just so I know where to put the right at. what, is, how did you want to do that? This is the only item we have and we have an hour. So how did you want to, yeah. you just want to do a quick overview of each and come back for conversations. Did you want to have a conversation for each? How do you want to do it? I mean, if we have an app, I mean, I wouldn't mind doing conversations speech. I just uh, would want to make sure we get through all of them. Um, so I can go through, I can go, how about we go through each one, each one and give a quick summary and then we can go back and do discussions so that that way at least everyone has an idea of what each one says. Um, and then we can go on to discussion. Yeah. So I guess, are you saying basically here that this, this option is distribution provides some kind of registration process for diffing an image that you're interested in. You pull it once and then you get uh, a diff on something to that effect. Um, so this is, we're still like at the pre-proposal stage. Um, the discussion, yeah, so binary delta is something which, so there are several ways you could solve this problem. Um, one of them is to do this like the RESTIC way, or I guess you could argue the RSync way. The RESTIC is probably a better example. Um, or the Git way, I guess, which is that uh, the actual storage format is split up so that instead of having one giant blob for the entire image, you have many small blobs, and then you can just reuse the existing distribution spec right. to download all the blobs you need. The downside so, of that obviously so is- I would say something so, like, I, I've got, I, I want this version, you put it together for me, or I could say, I have, you know, version one, give me version two, you know, tag two, please, right? Something to that effect. Yeah, um, and the question of, of ideally we would have we would have a discussion about binary deltas. And I mean, from what I've seen, um, binary deltas give you much better deduplication. Like it reduces the duplication cost even more than if you used constant defined chunking. Because the nice thing about binary deltas is that you know exactly what the difference is between the two images, as opposed to constant defined chunking, where you like you're coming up with a scheme which will hopefully reduce duplication generally. Um, so ideally, ideally we would support both because the right. problem with, uh, yeah. Yeah. So fair. So are you, then you're going to propose here in OCIB2 a intermediary format for the images to be able to transition from one version to the next, one tag to the next, something to that effect. Or, uh, or you are you like just saying that you're, it's just a, re, a, a requirement on just the distribution API? No, there, there would be are, changes to the image spec. There would be what, what, what kind of changes did you think about those or just curious how what the scope of that would be? Roughly. Um, so uh, the very least, it will be the replacement of tar archives from the image format. The reason being that there are there are several requirements which we'll get into when we go through the rest of them, which yeah, will sure. basically boil down to get rid of tar archives. Um, and then how we would deal with the transition. Um, this is something we'd obviously have to discuss in more detail later, but the way you could deal with it as transition is just like if the, if the client supports uh, V2, we'd have to deal with how we're going to deal with cli old clients and yada yada yada. That's a whole separate problem. But um, for a client that supports both versions, um, you wouldn't do binary deltas or anything. You would just pull the new version of the image, um, which is no worse than what you already have to do today. Um, it's just that any other up, any subsequent updates to the image would then have the benefits of reduced duplication or whatever other things we have. Um, but yeah, but we'd be, we're getting ahead of ourselves if we're discussing um, how we're going to deal with okay. upgrades. Okay, yeah. so, so, you're, so you're basically concerned that there may be some OCI image spec changes required here, so, okay. Yeah, that I would imagine there's going to be at least a couple. Um, 
Okay, I'm starting yeah. to get an idea then. Then when you say OCI V2, it's really a theme, right? It's not, it's not necessarily OCI image spec V2. It's, it's a theme of transitions that you want to make. Fe or yeah. feature. Well, I had to come up with a sexy name, right? Yeah, yeah, sexy name. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Well, I mean, it, when, you, not, when you said, so it's not, you're not deprecating the image spec or anything like that. You're saying you're going to have additional, yeah, and additional use cases, right? And you're going to, we might have to yeah. tweak. Okay, uh, that's fair. Okay, cool. Yeah. I nice. think V1.1 1 .1 is probably a better name, but less sexy. Yeah. It basically, <laughs> this would be like an addition to the image spec. It's unlikely we would actually need to go to V2.0 because um, that would be even more of a pain um, for many reasons. I, but yeah, I mean, like the, the original purpose of the OCI V1 image spec um, from the outset was to make it backwards compatible with Docker, um, with the Docker image, with the Docker image format. Right. Um, which is obviously right. Understandable I, I don't think because, that goes away, right? I mean, we're, we're not. We're not trying to break any existing containers. No, no, no. no. But I well, mean, it's, it's, I, I don't. The, sorry. No, I was just going to say, I, I, I don't think this is going to be compatible with Docker, like as it is. So I think it's, I mean, a lot of the things that we're proposing here, it's not clear to me how we would implement them in a sane way and be backwards compatible. I mean, I think one of the goals of this is to sort of advance the state of the art as opposed to just uh, do something else that's compatible with Docker. Right. But the point, the point is, is that old images will still be valid images in the new, in the new format. It's just that the new format that we would actually be using. So if, because, because we have different media types, what I'm literally talking about is like anything we add would just be a different media type. So old images would work perfectly fine and new images would have to add support for them, right? And yeah, as like I said, um, the idea here is that it's, it's improving on the, on, the, on the spec. Right, so either one- I'm just dying to jump in here, but I, you wanted to do an overview of each because as much as I love the media types, um, I'm actually, because you know, the stuff we're doing with Teleport is similar. We're basically, as long as the client is aware and the server is capable, there's like this initialization thing that happens. So if the client, for instance, doesn't know about this, you know, chunked format, for lack of a better word, it basically can revert back to the old one and the registries know how to do the segmentation, if you will. So right. a lot of this actually depends on the stuff that Vincent's been teasing us with the, um, the registry capabilities feature that if we can get that formalized, then yeah, the clients, extensions. Sure. yeah, extensions, thank you. Um, clients can kind of negotiate back going, hey, I really like this feature. Do you have it? Yes, yeah, great. Yeah, I'll talk that way. Cool. No, I'll talk this other way. Oh, can you please build me an, an old OCI 1.0 image? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, that, that's fair. Hey, I, I, think, I think it would be key to recognize that somewhere in the doc, right? That you're, you're not really trying to break the, the, we would be recommending, if not, you know, requiring registry support, still support the old the old images and maybe possibly be able to store uh, the new stuff, at, 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 you know, in reply, be an old tag. And Alexa, I did sort of mention it at the bottom, but it's, but it's a bit, I, I should expand that a bit more. Um, but yeah. Okay. I, I'm um, looking to yeah. wait for the next one. Yes. And I was going to say, yeah, the, the, the point here is, is that uh, the OCV1 image format, just to give a general background, because of the fact that it was based on the Docker image format, it had, let's say, um, it sort of was limited in terms of the scope of things that it could change, especially because we had to keep tar archives and we had to keep the existing way that we represented things in tar archives so that do the Docker Hub could migrate. So effectively, that was like a hard requirement from the outset. And the idea here is, is that we can now discuss what the next thing should look like without breaking back and back. I hope that that sort of makes sense. Yeah. Without breaking back and back, meaning, that old images on registries will still work. It's just that new images would use whatever new form we come up with. Um, okay, so I think we can uh, define this more clearly in terms of like uh, how exactly the flow is going to be. Because I mean, it's pretty easy with like the index format today. But I think by defining it early, we can quickly identify to see like what clients aren't handling, uh, say, media types correctly in the index. So for example, if we had V1, V2 images that were using the index for compatibility, like you push both up and then you can 
you, the clients can pull down. If they don't know what a V2 image is, that's fine. Um, it just looks like a normal index to them. They continue their pull. Um, but if you do understand the new type, uh, that it can be handled properly. So I, I think it'd be good to go through some of that flow so we could start identifying early where some of the gaps are. Because uh, as we know, it like takes a while to like, if we find like a major problem in one of the codes for supporting this, then it, it, it takes a little while to, to get that out there. Yeah, that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be a bad idea, I agree. Um, I should probably have asked this at the beginning, is someone taking notes? I guess it's recorded, so what, we, can, we can do notes later. Um, yeah, okay, so uh, yeah, I agree. Uh, just moving on to the next one. Um, so the next one is related to canonical representation. Um, so if you look at, this is more about um, image builders. So if you have two different uh, image, the, this, yeah, let's just say it, 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 that there are other issues related to um, verifiability, but basically uh, right now, two different image builders of a container image are almost guaranteed to produce different um, like resulting images. Uh, in terms of like the hash of the tar archive and the final digest you have for the image. Um, the reason for this being um, there, is a, there are a variety of aspects that, that are causing this in, in the spec, but one of them is that um, tar archives actually don't have a, rep, don't have a canonical representation um, in the different tar implementations. And I, I, have a, I have a very, very long blog post that goes into the details of exactly why this is. Um, but long story short, it's got to do with like 40 years or 50 years of Unix history. Um, but the, the net result is that uh, tar archives have this sort of fundamental problem that um, they don't have a chemical, chemical representation, which means that if you have two different um, image builders or even the same image builder on two different systems, um, they will produce, even if they have, you know, bit for bit identical file systems that they're archiving to create the final diff layer or whatever, um, they end up producing different uh, archives. It, and this is a this is a very common problem. I mean, there's even examples of like uh, you know the Ghost standard library has on several occasions uh, bro changed the output of archive tar, you know, so on and so on. So um, this is just sort of a general point of whatever we end up coming up with um, should ideally be as reproducible as possible um, with ideally a canonical representation that is actually enforced by the spec. That way we just avoid any issues with um, different image builders producing different things. Most ideally it would be that two different image builders would always produce the same thing. I'm not sure if we can actually, if we'll be able to actually enforce that, um, but it would be nice to at least have a spec that doesn't, that isn't like implicitly breaking the chances of reproducible building. Um, can you I elaborate that, a little bit on what the level of differences are? Like, is it just the um, digests and you know is subtly different you know there's enough subtlety that the digest winds up being different or if I literally untar from two different solutions I could wind up with different results like is is the files actually wind up being different somehow directories get messed up or it's just the compression algorithms wind up being different so the result is the same but when I'm looking at a tar it looks different uh, it, it, it's deeper than the compression, but it, uh, generally speaking, uh, it would, you would get the same extracted output, though I'm sure that Taika would, would love to have a discussion about, uh, about um, how correct extracting tar archives is. Um, but basic, generally speaking, um, when it's extracted, it looks the same. It's just that the, met, the actual on-disk format of tar has no canonical representation. Like there isn't even a spec for the tar format. Um, and in fact, I have a, if you would like to look more about this, I can, I can. I mean, the, sim the simplest example I can think of is you can just put two files in either order. So if your directory has foo and bar, I can put them in that order, foo and bar, or I can put them in the order bar and foo. Those both extract the same thing on the file system, but they'll have different hashes. And that's a very simple example, but X adders and blah, blah, blah. There's like a whole bunch of things that are sort of arbitrarily ordered. So nanoseconds for you know, nanoseconds. Think, yeah, I mean, there's there's like a million of these things. So his blog post elaborates on all this, but basically they just never defined things need to be in alphabetical order. We're always going to use nanoseconds, you know, yada yada, which I think is I what mean, they never requirement anything, about. really. So the problem is they kind of took it as an internal implementation detail that it shouldn't matter. But from what we're trying to do with registries and the secure supply secure supply chain workflows is we're trying to compare the transit format 
the you know I'm just trying to use transform the compression stuff content because it's between point A and B we're trying to say two things that are the same thing but were built differently. Uh, yeah, I, I think what you're trying to say the inter if we examine the internals of the tar at any two points from two different things it could be bad. Whereas the end result is supposed to be the uh, intent. Yeah, I'm not, I, never mind. You know, my mic should have been muted. I, it's clear in my head I'm not articulating the problem, but I think I understand what yeah. you're getting at. I think I, just I think having, and it, sorry. As I say, just, just having a format that produces like reliable results. So like, yeah, if everything was generated into like Go structures and then, then it's uh, encoded, you know, that's, that's like much better, but then you still have all these like JSON encoding and, and a bunch of nonsense like that. How do you, like, well, how do you even like encode the go structure? Ran go randomizes maps intentionally, right? So it's actually not better. If you just use Go structures, they reserve the right to randomize maps. So th there's a lot to this, but I, I think we probably all understand it so we can move on to the next one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I will say yeah. that, uh, the, the Go JSON library, uh, the, the standard library actually sorts um, JSON maps when they generated the, the 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 Go map is not in order, but the JSON maps they generate at least in the latest version of Go, I believe, are, are actually in order, like in alphabetical order based on this thing. But whatever, but yeah, that is something yeah. which will be a fun issue to deal with. Um, but yeah. Well, I was just gonna make the comment that like, really, these differences, the fact that there's differences, it doesn't, but it doesn't really produce a different file system, just shows that they shouldn't really be part of the encoding in the first place. If it, they don't actually matter. Uh, so like it's just a matter of defining what are the components. It, it, it's it's really hard. Like, are nanoseconds important? Yes or no? Like, uh, in the end, sometimes it doesn't matter, but sometimes it actually messes up your ability to diff to file systems when they change. Um, so, but those yeah. kind of details are really important. Yeah, and actually, you're skipping ahead. That's the next point. Is is um, what what metadata do we actually need to include in in, in images? Um, but yeah, but. Yeah, for kernel core representation, just generally speaking, um, this includes, I would say this includes mainly the stuff about, like, the goal here would be two different image builders, ideally implemented by different people, um, would produce the same final digest of the image. That, that would be the most ideal, like, end goal, um, I would say. Whether or not we actually get that to that point is another question, but I would, ideally that's, that's how things will end up. Um, okay. Uh, Right, and so the next one is, um, is yeah, is what you just mentioned. Um, effectively, there is, because again, this comes back to tar archives again, you may, you may sense a theme. Um, the, because tar archives, again, it's, let's say that the things that tar archives contain is sort of more of a bunch of conventions than a necessarily a specific set of, set of metadata. So uh, nanoseconds is one example of, of it. Another one is that not all forms of timestamps are stored in tar archives um, because in the original tar spec, there actually was only, I think, creation time or modified time was stored. And then the other two weren't actually stored. And so you need to use a different extension to use it. But the point is, is that um, the question that we should answer here is uh, we should actually have a formalized agreement of what metadata and what file system objects are actually relevant inside a container image. Um, for metadata, an obvious example is that the um, access creation, birth, and modification timestamps of things arguably aren't actually important um, for, for like, at least for distribution images. They're not important because uh, who really cares when a file was created in, like, who cares when libc was like originally created on some build machine in like some server factory. Um, uh, so that's one thing. Um, and in addition, some of the, as an aside, some of the timestamps actually you can't recreate. You can't recreate birth timestamps, for instance. Um, but yeah, so the, the, these sorts of metadata that is unclear, I mean, extender attributes is another good example. Um, certain extender attributes, it makes no sense to include inside containers. And right now, different image builders have different sets of, um, you know, uh, you know uh, ignore lists, effectively, for these different extender attributes. Um, and we should really standardize on which extended attributes are the things we want to include in all, in all containers and which ones don't, um, and so on and so on. So effectively, there is all this file system metadata. Oh, another one is file system attributes. So not extended attributes, but attributes like the immutable and append only and those attributes. All these different metadata, pieces of metadata about files 
whether or not they're included in, in, in container images is like basically based on what does the tar implementation in that language's standard library do is sort of what we've landed on, um, which is far from ideal for a variety of reasons. Um, one of them is again going back to reproducibility, um, but also it's really a question of like correctness in terms of uh, how do, like what should a container image actually contain is not a, isn't a clear question in terms of metadata, and also when you um, extract it. Uh, now, generally this isn't a problem, but in principle you could see that there there is a problem where certain standard libraries tar archiver doesn't actually support like setting false time attributes, for instance. Um, that's about all birth timestamps. Remember, birth timestamps aren't supported in TAR, but you can you get my point. There are certain having an idea of exactly what metadata or having a formalized set of metadata for the file system that actually is included in our archives would assist with both the reproducibility question as well as making sure that um, you don't end up in weird cases. Like, for instance, the example that comes to mind is that um, AUFS doesn't support XMED attributes, or at least it didn't for a while for a variety of reasons. And in certain circumstances, it's still open. Um, and so, for a while, if you want to build an image on Docker Hub that had XMED attributes in it, like the security capabilities one for like ping, um, it would actually cause the build to fail completely, um, which is not ideal. So, having a set of these things would also allow people who are doing like image building services can make sure that that, that all, the entire set of metadata that is supported can actually they can build everything. Um, and then one other thing is that is. Um, there are certain Boston objects which is unclear whether they should actually be inside images at all. Um, yeah, device signers is the obvious example um, because major minor numbers are system specific. So having them inside, now because TAR just puts them in the archive, that's what we've ended up storing them as. Um, but practically speaking, it makes little sense to actually have them inside images because they, the, the numbers aren't, you can't translate them between machines, generally speaking. Um, and also the runtime spec has its own way of specifying uh, devices. So it's a little bit strange to have uh, like a, an alternative way of specifying devices without telling the runtime spec about it, especially because the runtime spec generally when you run a container, it has the devices uh, allow list. So you would have to like you would have to add it to the allow list and currently that's not what happens. So um, yeah, this is just like a general point of we need to have an agreement on what metadata and file system objects are stored inside images. Um, and I sort of went on a bit there. Do you have any, because I know like we did some of this type of research a few years ago with continuity. Um, I know there was another, uh, there was another format, I forget what it's called that Red Hat uses. Um, I didn't know if you had another one, but we should, tr we should like do a merge of all those and at least in terms of like, I feel like we've done a lot of research. There's a lot of like there's a lot of these edge cases in figuring this out, like how like hard link representations work and stuff like that. Um, yeah, if you talk about OS tree, I think is probably what you're talking about, right? Yes, OS tree. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. I think uh, once we get, once we agree on a set of requirements, then we can, I definitely, basically everyone I mentioned this to has mentioned OS tree at some point. Um, yeah, OS tree is something that we'll have to look at um, and compare it to. And I mean, if, if OS tree works as is, then we can look at just adopting that. Um, and if there's things we need to adjust from it, then we need to then we need to do that. Um, as an, yeah, and hard link, that's another good point. Yeah, hard, li hard links, representation of hard links in, in images is gonna be painful um, because uh, there is like an issue of this, again, re reproducibility, but also duplication because of, you know, which hard link you encounter first has an impact on, on what the final image that you generate looks like. But yeah, there's also also things would be useful to um to first to see existing prior art for, for all these things. Um, yeah. Okay. So I. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, go. On. Okay. Uh, so I had brought up um, if uh, I was wondering if permissions can also fall into this. Um, I I know that. Uh, through configuration, you can kind of set, you know, what what uh, files have what permissions given to what user. So I'm wondering if it's necessary to leave uh, file permissions in the image and instead um, set them in the config. Um, do you mean like ownership? 
they, they, I, I commented out because I wasn't sure exactly what what you meant. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, 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 owner, um, you know the the mm, read, write, execute permissions, which also get okay. embedded in the tarball. Um, I don't know if that's something. Uh, that um, that would need to be included in the image, at least from from my perspective as you know distribution packaging. You would need to have both the permissions and the ownership embedded in the image um, because uh, that's something which is, I mean, for distributions, it, what files are owned by who matter, as well as the permissions on different files matters as well. Um, the thing with scanners is that ideally. Um, and that's something which I think I have is, is one of the later points is that yeah. Um, making it possible to scan images without having to extract them or having to deal with tar archives um, would ideally mean that you wouldn't actually have to scan an actual extracted file system. You would just do a scan of the blobs. That would be the, the ideal solution. Um, right. so, okay. so, you, so you would never actually have to have an extracted file system to scan. What about uh, running as a um, non-root user, uh, spinning up the container as a non-root non user does the current solution is the current solution enough? I for think that? That, like the user um, namespace stuff usually uses like a delta already for like in terms of like ownership. Usually, like it really depends. Like there's different types of file system. But that's more like a runtime thing because you can extract them as different users, or you can use like a something like shiftfs to do that as well. Yeah, or you can use the um, if you if you're talking about like strictly rootless containers without any um, Without any magical set UID bits, you can you also there's a um, there's a thing that me and Akihiro worked on, which is uh, you can set extended attributes on each file, and then at least Umochi and a couple of other image builders they will read the extended attributes. Again, this is come back to metadata. Um, they'll read the extended attributes and then figure out what the actual owner is meant to be. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. why I was wondering: it should that I mean you need to the client needs to have all that extra um processing in order to spin up a container as a non-root user would it be possible to have a canonical um, file system with a set of metadata that doesn't need that and instead have it set by some other configuration um i mean the the ownership of individual files is something which is which needs to be set, sorry, is set by the either the distribution or who, whatever the vendor is. Um, the thing about, yeah, about user namespaces and remapping is something which, as, um, I'm sorry, I, I didn't catch that, but yeah, they're right that you need to, um, uh, that that's a runtime thing. I mean, especially because in theory, at some point, Linux will have support for just transparently remapping file systems. So in theory, there would be no work done by the runtime aside from doing a special kind of bind now. Again, okay. this is like in theory at some point. Um, okay. But yeah. The, the representation also needs some notion of like at least a difference of users. So like you could have like file systems in the container where most of the files are owned by root, but then you might have another user defined in there. Um, and this was, this is always a tricky thing. Like is it, is it, you just boil everything down to UUIDs, these kind of numeric IDs and then try to map that back to a, let the kind of the extractor take care of like mapping that back to a user. Um, but I, I think what's, what's kind of most important is, yeah, just being able to define what the relationship between the users of, that are the owners of the different files are. Um, and then, yeah, the extractions might be different, but I think from the perspective of uh, looking at the file system and expecting it from the metadata, um, that's the most important part. So you would always assume that like zero is usually gets extracted as root. Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, okay. the Etsy password is a file in the file system, so you would need to uh, it would need to have to make sense. Like it, they would need to match effectively. Um, so if, just purely from Etsy password, we're sort of forced to, to store numeric uh, IDs and GIDs. Um, yeah. Okay. So. Um, yeah, the next one is mountable file system, and I'll let Tycho, I'll give my voice a break and Tycho can quickly give an overview of that. Sure. Um, so the idea here is really, there's two kind of major points. The first one is if you think about what happens when you download a container, or when you say, you know, run this container, whether it's 
Docker or, you know, run C or whatever is somebody downloads a bunch of tar, tar archives and then they extract them. And that does two things. One, it, you know, roughly doubles your disk space. I mean, maybe things are compressed well, but maybe they're not. And so you, you know, you sort of have now all of a sudden uh, twice the disk space requirement. Um, and the other thing is if you sign an image, for example, with Docker content trust or something, um, you know, you download the image signature and, uh, you know, you can check that when you've downloaded the tar balls, but then as soon as you extract that from the tar archive onto the file system, you sort of destroyed any information that that signature gave you. And in particular, a lot of these, uh, container runtimes all store things in like overlay FS, you know, directories where there's like some, the, the hash of the blob is the root. And then, you know, below that is whatever was the part of the contents of that blob. And so if you know the layout of this, you can just go CD to that directory and modify the file system in some way. You know, you have to have root permissions maybe, but you know, there's just, it, it would be a lot nicer if we, A, didn't have to do this extract step because it requires two, two X storage roughly. Um, B, it uh, destroys the information on the signatures, and C, it's like a bunch of processing that you have to do that you wouldn't necessarily otherwise have to do. Um, and so an example of, like, the, the simplest example of this is, I think he, uh, somewhere it's listed, um, is basically just if you take all the tar archives and you throw those away and you just replace it with SquashFS, and so you use an OCI layout, uh, but each thing is a SquashFS layer, then you can mount that SquashFS layer um, you know, and do the same kind of overlay trick that runtimes do now, but the backing store was the squash of S thing, which, you know, you didn't ha need two X space for, you didn't have to do a bunch of decompression, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and again, with squash of S, you can choose your compression. So most things are exit, but if you, if there's some particular layer that you, you know, want to be access really fast, you can choose no compression or whatever. So you can kind of optimize, um, the, the builder could, could optimize, or, you know, the, um, if you, if you didn't mind doing extract step, you could also on the, at the runtime side, optimize things a little bit, but generally I'm thinking you'd build smarts about this end of the builder so that people can say this, this part of the image is important. We should make this fast or whatever. So that's sort of the, I guess the motivating use case. Um, and th I mean, the reason here is we are, I, I work for Cisco and we basically have appliances and, you know, people can do all kinds of things to the appliances. There's all kinds of security vulnerabilities. We have some large number of developers that sit above this, um, the, above our appliance, they may introduce bugs. If they introduce bugs, people can inject code, yada, yada, yada. So we really want this when we run a container, we want to know that it, it was were the bits that were signed during the Cisco build, roughly. So um, I guess that's our, I don't know if that, does anybody have any questions on this? So your motivation is more nope. around security than, and disk space is kind of the way you're thinking about it? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, those are kind of our two. So we have, you know, our applications are huge because huge we have lots of de developers and dependencies. Um, but then also the, the security piece is really important to us as well. We want to be sure that the Cisco build system thing is the thing that we sign. And we could achieve this in other ways by doing Docker content trust and doing IMA, you know, signing every, like there's, there's a number of different ways that we could do this, but basically we already signed container images. This seems like a sort of a very obvious extension. The sort of the unfortunate part is um, the, the way the Linux kernel works, it sort of restricts a lot of uh, potential design choices we can make um, in terms of, I think I posted like a, uh, just a, a straw man example. And I, you know, if you read that straw man example at all in the, the kernel code, it was like, you have to do a whole bunch of horrible surgery that the VS DFS people are not going to like. Um, so anyway, there's, there's a bunch of, I think, research to be done here in terms of what, what can we do? What, what are, uh, what are the VFS people going to be okay with that type of thing? Um, but at least in principle, I think this can mesh well with other requirements. Yeah. It's just, it's interesting. That's, 
it's similar. You know, you basically are saying is the notary stuff that we've been doing with V2 and, and certainly Docker Content Trust is all about securing the content from the registry to the machine. But once it's gotten to the machine, the, then in its expansion, all bets are off. So it, right. that's what I'm trying that, to get a sense of, of what your pivot is, is, is the security that once the, it's expanded, the, can I still evaluate the security of the content in it? Yes. And so the, the, the pivot really is, is just, all bets are still on. When when you guys do a, a implementation of image signing for OCI using Notary V2 or whatever whatever it is, that should be enough for us to verify at runtime what we're running. Uh, we would like to use those same signatures and that whole same signature platform. Um, and and we can't right now because we have to extract stuff. But given that we're designing a new image format, we could design it in such a way that we wouldn't have to do that and therefore could use the signatures. So the signatures work you guys are doing buys us a lot more if we do this imagery design correctly. Well, hey, I'll remember to reach out to you, but please stay engaged because we'll, this is a good one to get. Like we have not been thinking about, although it's come up, we've not been, you know, it's one of those, there's so many problems at one Barrett. We're just trying to get the signatures that can move between within and within registries and across registries and into air gapped environments. That's been like the prize zero thing we got to solve, but you're right. They, they're, right now, we are not scoping once it gets to the machine and gets expanded, did did get hacked while it's getting expanded. And that's, it'd be good to think about how we could do additional signing verification, uh, verification in the signing flow that gives you more confidence. So that'd be cool. So, I, I mean, I think the, the sales pitch for this is that if we design OCI v2 correctly, you don't have to do any additional work. There's no additional work that you guys have to do on the repository end at all. It just comes for free because, you know, it's a, there's a sign manifest and everything's content addressed. And so um, it all just magically works. Uh, you know, it remains the kernelly bits and all that stuff has to be fit together, but at least in principle, it should be zero extra extra work to get this, assuming that you guys can get signatures to, to the endpoint. Yeah, the idea would be like, the loose idea would be that you have, you download the image and you verify the signature during the download or after the download, and then you have this um, digest, which is the thing you've just verified, and you just do mount OCI image dash O the digest onto a file system, and that's it. That, that would be the idea. Um, and so there would be no extra. So you think that there. you think that the notary v2 stuff, if we just get a good signature flow that you can add to this later and we don't have to, we don't have to boil both of them at the same time. We can do an incremental. Absolutely. Yeah. Hold us accountable to that. That'd be awesome. Uh, all right. Um, yeah, we're running out of time. So I'll, I'll uh, niche you up next. Um, just, yeah, real quick build of materials. I think, I think most people know what build materials are because we've been discussing it for a while. Yeah, um, so <laughs> this, is, this is basically uh, very similar to the canonical representation and the reproducibility. Um, what I am specifically looking for is provenance information for um, the pieces that were contributed to a specific container. So this is very similar to uh, a bill of materials that may be uh, created for a distro. Um, identifying all the projects that contributed to a distro, their versions, their licenses, uh, and um, hopefully uh, equivalent corresponding sources as well. Um, but at the minimum, I would think that just being able to identify who the supplier is of uh, the pieces that came into the uh, container image would be a good start. Um, just to give like a, a minimal uh, thing there. So um, some way of uh, listing or some way of including in the image um, the uh, who who made this part? Who made this bit? Where did it come from? Uh, what version was it? And what licenses uh, governed the distribution of it? And then, you know, you can 
Now, here's where there's a slippery slope that we might be hitting at to include the software bill of materials because there are many uh, folks who will say like, why isn't my metadata represented in here? For example, uh, security folks will probably want to uh, do something like, oh, uh, is, is, this, is this the latest version or not? Um, is there uh, any vulnerabilities associated with it? Um, so there's, there's uh, some part of work that we need to do in order to figure out what the minimal amount of metadata is needed to describe what's in the image. But definitely the, the missing part from OCI v1 is um, identifying the supplier of each of the file system chain sets that went into the image. So uh, I, yeah, it would be nice if that was included somewhere. Yeah, and um, one thing I, I, would, I, I would, sorry. No, uh, go ahead, sorry, I'm done. I interrupt you. Okay, I was gonna say, yeah, the one thing that I would, that I would personally like to see as well is, um, is something a little bit stronger than that, which is that um, not just the some change sets, but it would be ideal. And this actually links into the scanning thing you mentioned earlier, which actually is why I realized it's not actually listed in here. Um, the scanning is because ideally, if we if we got the bill of material set up right, where you could trace the files in the file system to which provider and which version of, in the case of distributions, which version of which package is included. Um, in theory, you wouldn't actually need to have any scanning. It would just be you look at the bill of materials and you can verify that the bill of materials does match what's in the container image. That would be the scanning. You say bill of materials. Here is the container image. Does it does do they match up? Is there anything in the container image that isn't in the bill of materials? If yes, give an error. And then you can look at the bill of materials and say, well, for these vendors, I know how to check for security bugs or whatever. Like I know that if as I know that SUSE has this particular API to get these things. Obviously, this is stuff which is I think out of scope of OCI in terms of how it would work. But ideally, you would have for you know an actual image scanning utility or, or a, a image registry would say. I, don't, I have these images, these are available materials, I verify that, the, that they actually match, and then I say, okay, um, these are the rel packages, or these are the SLEE packages, or these are the Debian packages in this image, and then I go and check with those distributions to see whether or not there are any known security vulnerabilities. Um, I, I'm not trying to scope create, but, I, but I'm saying that ideally if we had something like that, which, which from the spec side might be as minimal as the vendor, uh, the version of the package, and the name of the package, like as an example, um, you could actually completely remove the need for scanning tools. It would, I mean, there would still be a scanning tool, but the, the scanning would be boiled down to does the bill of materials match and then look at the bill of materials metadata without ever, ever having to extract an image. Um, it would be ideal. Yeah. Um, in my experience, I don't see that happening because people come up with all kinds of creative ways to put software on uh, file systems. So, um, what I would envision, though, is this gives a developer uh, the ability to audit their images before they send them down the pipeline. So, I mean, it's one of those things like once you once you increment again and again, and your processes become uh, more and more streamlined, then yes, there will be a point where you wouldn't have to scan an image because your auditing in the front end is that good. So uh, in that sense, yeah, I agree with you. But it's not like really <laughs> completely eliminating scanning, I don't think. Yeah, I, I don't think we're gonna get as far as that. But I think, yeah, it's, I mean, at least for distributions, um, being able to say, here are the packages that we got from RHEL or whatever would be, would, would solve like an entire, I mean, half of what image scanners do is just looking at what distro packages they have. Um, and eliminating that would be a good idea. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, and as usual with meetings, um, we have five items less than we have five minutes to do it. Um, I, I think I'm just going to rage through this because actually these are some of the ones that I wanted to say are um, lazy fetch support. Is anyone here who wants to talk about lazy fetch support? A meaty stuff okay, here I that, that I, I would suggest you make your pitch for another time 
and we because yep. we should talk about that because I, I don't think you'll get through any of I, there's probably some of these you've already discussed we wanted to talk more about but there's no way you're going to get the rest yeah. of these in five minutes so yeah I, was gonna I, say, I suggest next week big... pick up v2 part two <laughs> yeah. so uh, i wonder if we could move this meeting to a more reasonable time for um, the folks in china um, the on the other and side of the world and Australia, yes, the other side of the world. <laughs> yeah, so here's the problem is what do we do about the folks on the East Coast? So um, like being on the West Coast and being from New York, I kind of understand both sides, but it's like when uh, I don't mind getting up early, but that doesn't do any good for China. I, if I were, if I want to do late, which is good for China, it's like 8 p.m. for East Coast. Who's on the East Coast on this call, actually? Phil, usually. Yeah, he's already gone. He's already, and I think Phil he actually and, got them uh, to another meeting. He did. I was going to make a joke. Him and Vincent are already drinking wine and had too much. Um, so I don't know what to, like, That this has been the challenge is, like, for Alexa, I, I don't have a, sorry, I don't have a lot of sympathy because just get up a little hour early there, dude. And, you know, uh, you're already in your shirt your loose shirt anyway but it's the the folks in china that i feel really bad for because it's like the middle of the night um so so uh, my my usual hours are like 6 a.m in the morning and i'm on the west coast um is mo are most of the folks here on the west coast no the uh, problem is trying to balance east east coast u.s west coast u.s and uh, Asia, like even Europe isn't that bad of a problem. So I think if we can get the folks on the East Coast to agree to like us between seven and eight, because that's Josh is in Central, um, as an example, and he represents, you know, a group of people in the middle of the country as well. So I don't, Amy, what do you suggest on how to get quorum on how do we do this? So we can do a couple different things. We can start a rotating call schedule where like because this is a weekly meeting that happens semi-weekly on occasion, um, we can start actually publicizing that like we move this meeting say two hours back and then we keep it on like normal time sometimes. Um, we can move it just like directly and see who actually shows up. Um, obviously we should put this on the mailing list. Um, my thinking is actually that we actually, we, ha we should have a rotating schedule where sometimes it's easier for East Coast and sometimes it's easier for China. I don't hear screaming. Oops. I'm okay with it, so. Okay. Well, it'd be, as long, long as we define, you know, that that's not 2 a.m. Central time. No, 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 but like- I think, um, Mike, being you're okay to... regardless. It's the, it's really- um, it, It's our edge cases. China and East Coast are the problems that seem to have the most balanced problems. Um, we don't, to my knowledge right now, have any European folks that are trying to be able to join this uh, call. I'm European. Okay, thank you. That that helps. We do. We probably would have more if it was any kind of reasonable time. <laughs> exactly. Well, exactly. If we start shifting this around, then we might be able to get a little bit more input. Also, the understanding that these are recorded and available, and people can come in and like you know do things as well. Um, I'm I'm perfectly willing to look into uh, making a rotating schedule that we have one that's friendly towards East Coast and towards Europe, that it's slightly less friendly for um, the West Coast and just awful for um, folks in Asia Pacific. And then another meeting that is reasonably good for the folks on the West Coast, kind of bad for the folks on the East Coast and awful for Europe. Yeah, and then when you find the right hour, it's usually, you know, everybody's can't come because they're that You mean hour 8 a.m. Pacific? Yeah, 8 a.m. Pacific has everybody on top of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, no. <laughs> oh, good and, and, Yeah, and seven, right. Exactly. So, like, uh, we may also want to be able to consider having this be like a more monthly meeting, um, given as we've canceled the last few due to lack of agenda. And I recognize this is waking up other decisions in here that maybe probably need to go to a mailing list. But um, if everybody knew that this was only like a once a month thing that kind of moved around, we might actually get more done. How many time slots do we think we need, Amy? Is it just two? for like a morning like this that gets us set and then an evening, well, I'm doing it from Pacific Coast kind of perspective, um, 
another time slot that is uh, early morning China, late East Coast, but still reasonable for Central and West. So two is good. Trying to be able to do three and people will start not trusting their calendars about when yeah. they were supposed to be there and that sort of thing. You got um, it. Yep. Yeah, sorry. I've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it. It's, it's, um, it's, been, it's, been, it's been this time for almost four years now. Exactly. So I don't really want to be able to shake everybody up immediately. So if we did one at 6 p.m. Pacific, basically three hours from now, that, Till, where does that leave you, actually? Uh, it's 11, it's 12 o'clock here now, so... 12 so p.m. Four, four, 12 o'clock a.m. Sorry, middle of the night. It's, middle of the night. Exactly. exactly, now we're at 3 a.m. his time. That's what's yep. happening. Yeah, it throws yeah. Europe out. Yep. Yep. Right. Or, you, or you'll be posted. So this, basically, tomorrow. this can be in Americas, including Australia, which is really, really South America, um, and <laughs> and uh, Europe. Good. And then there's a evening that does good for, it's still reasonable for West Coast, but then picks up China, but loses Europe. That's kind of what I'm hearing. Because if we go much earlier, well, that's the other thing. What if we went... Well, I think Mike's pitch is don't make, don't change this one, add one, but don't change this one. Because if we did make this one a bit earlier, then till would be more reasonable. Uh, because if the one that we're going to do, the one that I would propose we do at 6 p.m. Pacific time, obviously is not very reasonable for till, but it, it's the morning for China, at least parts of China. Yeah, yeah so 7 a.m. is you, uh, West Coast is usually pretty good. But for who? Everybody's busy. Everybody. Oh, it was really bad, you mean? No, no, no. It's 7 a.m. West Coast. Preempted by so many other things, right? Oh, it's, yeah, it's yeah, yeah. the window. It, it, but it is preempted by too many things. So it's hard to, but, you know, I'm, I'm sure some people would, you know, skip what they need to be able to make that time, right? And everybody could come. Okay. Just, so it's let me time. do a sanity test. Till, if we did one that was three hours from now, which is 3 a.m. for you, and but then picked up Alexa and the Asia folks, and you had to watch that one on a recording. And then the alternative ones are ones that are still at this time, as opposed to trying to do earlier. Is that reasonable? I'm picking you as the representative for all of Europe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm probably the only one here as well. Uh, yeah, if I can pick it up on the recordings, um, basically add my stuff via mail, that will work. Okay. Why don't we do this, Amy, why don't we, I don't know if next week is too early for everybody's schedule, maybe two weeks out, do one that's a China-friendly time. Of, we're hitting the week of July 4th, and I'm not sure how many of the Americans are going to be lurking around. Yeah. Just, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> well, actually, we next week, thing. yeah, two <laughs> weeks is the July 4th long weekend. Why don't we, why don't we try next week do a, a, a 6 p.m. Pacific time to see if we can pick up uh, the Asia folks. I was actually going to track towards the week of the 8th because okay. that gives us enough time to be able to socialize this and enough people to be able to like, you know, hey, look, where are you at 2 p.m. Pacific? Oh, wait, it's moved to 6 p.m. Pacific. Gotcha. Okay. Why I'm happy to that? move it now and see what happens. Um, uh, it, it should send out invites and I can update that calendar invite. I will make it a single invite and then we can decide at the end of it whether or not we should keep it. That sounds good. Uh, okay. Alexa and Tycho, do you want to continue this next week or would you rather wait for the, the China friendly time to pick up the second half of this? Uh, well, actually, given that quite a few people who contributed the second half of the stuff uh, from China, it probably wouldn't be a bad idea to wait for the China friendly time. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking the same thing. So that sounds reasonable. All right, that is moving now. You all should get invites. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Happy to help. All right. Thanks, folks. Great content. Good to see all of you. Thanks, all. Bye. All right. Happy hacking. Bye-bye. Later. Bye.